Okay. Um, the handout uh, begins with a with a quote from one of my favorite philosophers, the great uh, British philosopher David Hume. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see there, Hume says, and by nicety he means really uh, a kind of a, fine- a delicate problem uh, to sort out the difference between what Hume calls chance and what he calls causes. And by chance, he doesn't really mean a suspension of causality. By chance, he means those causes that are hard to find, those causes that are, um, have to do with individuals, uh, with contingencies, with mistakes, uh, with unintentional acts. We, we, all our, life, our life is full of, of chance of that sort. Um, if you ask yourself, what brings you here to this particular place, uh, it seems to me it's very hard not to separate out from this explanation. Uh, lots of chance encounters of one sort or another. By cause, what Hume means are those deeper, more public, uh, more predictable uh, causes that usually have to do not with individuals, uh, but with larger groups of people, with what we would call movements, with all of those large institutional changes, particularly that we talked about last time. It's, it's not a surprise that, that people, when something bad happens, uh, people very often like to emphasize the chance part of it. At the very end of the lecture today, I'll talk about one famous example of that in David Lloyd George's explanation for why war came in 1914. It's always somehow reassuring and uh, it relieves us of responsibility by thinking that if it's something really bad, um, it wasn't anybody's fault, it just sort of happened. The other extreme to that, and if the first of these, if the chance explanation tends to be a kind of insider's bias, uh, the other extreme of that are those explanations that emphasize the inevitability of things. This tends, I think, to be a kind of outsider bias. It looks to us from the outside when we see something happening, and it had to happen that way. And there, there are lots of inevitable explanations for the origins of the First World War. They take different forms. German aggression, uh, imperial conflict, the fear of revolution. There are any number of explanations that historians have offered to suggest that what happened in 1914 had to happen. Well, I, again, I think if we think about our own lives, we think about trying to explain things that are important to us. It, it's hard to get away from the conclusion that the things that happen are a combination of what Hume would call chance and what Hume would call cause. But there are big institutional forces at work in our lives that we that we are only uh, that we're aware of, but over which we have relatively limited control. And there are those chances, those chance meetings, those mistakes, those false turns, those missed appointments, all of those small events, which very often, either individually or cumulative, cumulatively, have a great deal of effect on where we are, who we are, what we do. Well, the last lecture was a cause lecture. Uh, It was a lecture that talked about those big forces at work. And today we're going to bring in a few more elements of chance. Although before we do, let's review in our minds the the causal ones, because these are in some ways the more more interesting, the more important for us to, to grasp. Chance is by its very nature unpredictable. Chance is by its very nature hard to hard to get our hand around whereas causes are something that we can learn about the way the world works by example. When we saw last week uh, the globalization, the creation of a global society, the the railroads, the steamboats, the telegraphs that created it, uh, we saw how there was a a general sense among many contemporaries uh, that the world was closing up, it was being given out, that frontiers were disappearing, that as Lord Salisbury, the British Foreign Secretary, said, 
uh, people are staking their claims everywhere, using a kind of mining analogy. Staking, people are staking their claims to the world, and there are not that many claims left. We have to go out there and stake our own before everything's gone. And finally, we saw last time about the, the rising level of, of violence, uh, of small wars, a few not-so-small wars, as different groups either push at the frontier and, and find that there is resistance to their expansion, or as they try to position themselves with, with various colonial rivalries to get a piece of the action while there's still action out there to be had. Well, now, I want to turn to the place where war began. I already told you that when we want to ask the why and the when, we have to ask about the where. And and as I said, and as we know, the war began in what I called in an earlier lecture the borderlands, this space in here along between the Baltic and the Mediterranean, uh, a place of very of unstable uh, political geography, uh, a place where there are a number of, of sources of conflict. And of a special interest in us is in within these borderlands, the place where, in fact, more specifically the war began, this area right in here that we usually refer to as the Balkans. Well, they are changed by those causal forces that we've talked about and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, Changes in in, um, transportation. Railroads get built here. Seaports, particularly along the Dalmatian coast, are very important as trade becomes important. The straits, the entrance between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, is extremely important for Russia because of the trade of Russian agriculture that, that takes place in the, in the rich soil of the, of the South now, because Russia becomes a part of a world agricultural market. That has to do, of course, with the changes in sea steamship and maritime technology. In this part of the world, as, as everywhere else, there was a sense of closing frontiers, of pressure, particularly on a, on a declining Ottoman Empire. We saw uh, two, two weeks ago how the Austrians annexed Bosnia uh, because they felt that they had to take it, they had to get it, and if they didn't get it now, they might not, they might not get it, they might not get another chance. So there was this same sense of closing in, of grabbing while grabbing was to be done. And of course, as you saw when you listened to the podcast of, of Dr. Wetzel's lecture, you, you saw in the Balkan Wars a intense level of violence, one of the, one of the most horrendous complex of violence uh, in the whole late, in the whole run up to 1914. Globalization and all of its different impacts, a sense of closing frontiers, a rising level of violence. These global forces we could find everywhere. We can find them in Latin America, we can find them in Africa, we find them in Asia, we find them in this part of the world as well. But there are two differences, I think. Two differences to make this where, this geopolitics, a particularly important part of the move towards the Great War. Two things, two differences that we should bear in mind. The first difference has to do with the nature of those Balkan Wars that uh, David Wetzel talked to you about. These are not small wars in the way of the war in the Sudan. These are not anti-insurrectionary wars. Nor are they colonial wars like the war, let's say, between the United States and Spain, taking place to hand out, to parcel out over, over parts of real estate that are not really close to the heartland of either participant. These two Balkan wars of 1912-1913 are national wars. They are, in some ways, more like the wars of German and Italian unification that you studied a few weeks ago. They're both carried out by states who, who believe they should be able to include more of those they regard as fellow nationals within their boundaries. 
So these are national wars, and they're also wars in which the, the existence of the state and the existence of the participants are at stake. In a way, let's say that they aren't for the United States or Spain. The United States and Spain are going to survive the Spanish-American War in one way or another. Neither of them are going to go under because they win or lose. Now, the stakes in these Balkan Wars of 1912-1913 are higher. And particularly because of their national characteristic, particularly because they, had to, they have to do with ethnic animosity and national aspirations, there is about them a, a, a violence and an aggression and an open-endedness that one didn't always find in the more limited uh, colonial wars, which were bloody and violent and horrible for those involved, but in which the stakes were necessarily constrained. The second difference, and this is in the more important one for our purposes, the second difference is about a, a difference about this part of the world is that here, and only here, I think, the existence of a great power is at stake by what's happening. That is to say, it's not just the interests of the great power, which are represented in, in various places, but the, in, but the very existence, the very survival of a great power. And this great power is, of course, Austria-Hungary. The origins of the First World War are inseparable from the problems of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. It is intrinsic to their existence. It is their war more than anyone else's. Not only their war by any, by any means, but it is in its origins, in its beginning, as well as in its end, the war of the Habsburgs. And we've seen why that should be so. We've seen how, as the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, and it is, the, let's, one should always remember, the weakest of the great powers. The great power that, with the smallest population, with the fewest, thinnest resources, it spends roughly half on defense, what the Germans do, for example. In some ways, its geopolitical weight is closer to the second rank powers like Italy and the Ottomans than it is to the, the big powers like, like Germany and Russia and England. So it's the weakest of the great powers. It is also, among the great powers, the one that is most narrowly and heavily invested in one area. The Austrians did not benefit from that process of globalization that we've talked about. They were not big winners in it, as the, Britons, as, the, as the British were, or even as the Germans. They were, as you know, and as you remember from the things you've learned already in this course, the Austrians were defeated in Italy. They were defeated in Germany. They were pushed out of these two traditional areas for their uh, interests and expansion. So they became, by default, if nothing else, a Balkan power, a power in which this, this area was of central and in some sense exclusive importance. This is what the policymakers in Vienna thought about. This is what they worried about when they got up in the morning and when they went to bed at night. This was the part of the world where they saw their interests most deeply involved. Moreover, and again, this repeats something that I said earlier, but it's important always to keep in mind. The reason why this area is so important to the Habsburgs is not simply because of their international position, not simply because of the geopolitics of this part of the European continent. It's important to them because it directly affects their domestic character, their internal structure. It is one of, the, one of the fundamental assumptions of sovereignty that domestic and foreign policy are separate, that we treat our foreign enemies differently than we treat our domestic opponents. One of the characteristics of the Habsburg monarchy is that this distinction is very, very difficult for them to make. 
It's very difficult for them to make for the obvious reason that they are a multinational empire which, have, which has within its borders a number of different, uh, different, con- different ethnic groups which also then have connections outside. Italians, Germans, South Slavs, Serbs, and the, and the rest. So the, the domestic dom- internal policies uh, are, for the Habsburgs, extremely difficult to sort out, and that makes having either one, a coherent and cohesive policy in either domestic or foreign affairs, that much more difficult. So that takes care, in a way, of the the where of the the causes of 1914. The where is this very uh, fractured and unstable landscape of southeastern Europe. But now we have to think about the when. Why is it 1914? If we can understand why this is an area of particularly volatile, dangerous potential for the international system. Why is it 1914? Not 1910, or 1905, or 1900, or 1930 for that matter. Why 1914? And again, to understand that, we have to look at the problems of, of, of the Habsburgs, the particular problems that they were facing by the beginning of the year 1910. The last 24 months had been very, very unfavorable for them. The Balkan Wars, the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, its further weakening in this area, was very bad for Habsburg's influence. It's very bad because they constantly, although they'd had their century-long rivalry with the Ottomans, They'd always looked at the Ottomans as a balance, as a potential check to the influence of the Russians and also to the influence of these small national states that that grew up in the 19th century out of the wreckage of the Ottoman Empire. So the the, the defeat, the military disasters that the Ottomans faced in, in 1911 at the hands of the Italians, 1912 then at the hands of their Balkan enemies, These are very bad for the Austrians, even though not a single Austrian troop is involved. The other very, very unpleasant, dangerous event of 1912-13 is the fact that the big winner of the Balkan War is none other than the Serbs. Their potential balance, the Ottomans, lose their most committed opponent in the region wins. And if you look at this map, you can see this shaded area here are the parts that the Serbs won in the Balkan War. So you can see they they almost doubled in size, or maybe I think he actually did double in size, although not in population, because of their military victory. And once again, the Serbs are dangerous because not only are they a foreign political enemy on the other side of the Austrian border, which is right up here, they're also dangerous because they could serve as a potential magnet for the South Slav uh, residents of the Habsburg monarchy itself. So it's a double double whammy for, for for the Habsburgs. In fact, so uh, disturbed are they, so so generally uh, threatened by what happens in 1912, does the Habsburgs seriously consider going to war? Our friend uh, Conrad von Hotzendorf, who we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, wants to go to war. Of course, he always wants to go to war. It's kind of his default setting, right? I mean, if you ask him this, he'd say, well, let's, let's do it. Uh, but he certainly wants to go to war in 1912, um, which prompts uh, Sir Edward Gray, the British Foreign Secretary, who again will play a part in our story later on, to call in the German ambassador in December 1912. It looks as though the Austrians are going are to really go after the Serbs. They're going to send their army into Serbia. 
And this is where Sir Edward Gray says to Prince Lichnowsky, the German ambassador, if a European war were to arise through Austria's attacking Serbia, and if Russia, compelled by public opinion, were to march into Galicia rather than put up with a humiliation like that of 1909, that is after the Bosnian crisis, thus forcing Germany to come to the aid of Austria, France would inevitably be drawn in and, this is the part the German ambassador listened to very carefully, and no one can foretell what further developments might follow. Well, now, you recognize this is exactly the story that we're going to be telling in this hour. Action against the Serbs. Russia comes in. Germany comes in in the aid of the Austrians. The French join the Russians. And the final story, no one can foretell what further developments might follow. Well, the ambassador knows what what Gray means. He means the chances are very good that we, the British, are going to come in on the French and Russian side. So they come very close, even in 1912, to setting in motion some of the forces that we'll be talking about, but they don't. That's important, too. In 1913, the system, the international system, the system that you've studied in one way or another for much of this semester, the international system continues to work. There are conferences. The conflicts are contained. Uh, some element of, of, of peace settlement is, uh, is established. And the Austrians, with great difficulty, and only by threatening war, are able to do the two things that are most interesting and important to them, at least in the short run. And that is to contain Serbia by denying it access to the coast, that is, by denying it, to a, a denying it a seaport on the Dalmatian coast in the Adriatic, and, secondly, to create, as a kind of balance to the Serbia, an independent Albania out of formerly Ottoman land. These are the, the two goals of Austrian policy. They're both fulfilled in the course of 1913 with great difficulty. The great powers have a lot of trouble with Montenegro, this little tiny country up here. It's still there. A little tiny country uh, who uh, decides that they want to have an important seaport down here and won't give it up despite the fact that all of the great powers sort of line up against them. But in the end, they uh, have to come down. I mean, Montenegro's got about 300,000 people, so it's... uh, it's the size of a sort of a middle-sized city um, these days. But in any case, they managed to, to bully the Montenegrins into giving up. An independent Albania is created. The Serbs are kept from access to the sea, which gives them, uh, which means, means that the, the, the Austrians are able to control uh, the Serbian use of the Danube up here. Um, and at the end of 1913, the Austrians come out of it. They don't go to war. But they realize that it was a close-run thing. They realize that the reason they won was because they were threat- they were willing to threaten. They were willing to go to the mat, really to go to the mats if they had to. They were willing to use force. It wasn't diplomatic skill. It wasn't that that got them where they were. It was, a, it was that willingness to say, okay, you want to fight, we'll do it. The other thing that worries them in 1913 is that they're worried that the Germans were not as firmly in their camp as they'd hoped. It's true that the Germans supported them. The Germans, their their ally, their their big, important, powerful ally that they had to have. The Germans had shown, from the Austrian point of view, a depressingly low level of interest to what was going on in the Balkans. After all, the Germans had lots of interests. They were in Africa. They had a fleet. They were in Asia. They had people in China. They were all over. They were a world power. And somehow, 
what was going on here down in Scutari didn't seem as important in Berlin as it did in Vienna. Now, this takes us to the beginning of our story. And before we, we get into the, into the narrative, which is a largely what it, the time today is going to be, before we get into the narrative, let, let me make one more general set of, of observations. Uh, and that has to do with the nature of the Habsburg monarchy. Because I think it's such an important part of, of the story that you've, you've listened to in this semester as a whole. It was one of the five great powers. It was, as you saw when you studied the Congress of Vienna in 1815, it was, led by Metternich, in many ways a foundational power for the international system that governed international affairs in the 19th century in one way or another. And that was because, I think, Metternich recognized that the international system was essential to Austria's survival. That the very nature of Austria as a multinational state required a cooperative set of actions among the great powers, required the the kinds of limitations and restraints uh, that Metternich tried to, to build into the system. Not, not out of humanitarian purposes, not because he loved peace, not because he wanted uh, a, a wonderful life for everybody, but because he saw that this was the interest of the state that he was representing. So in a way, the crisis of Austria-Hungary, which is, as I tried to say, the crisis of 1914, the crisis from which the First World War emerges, The crisis of uh, 1914 is a larger crisis of the system as a whole. It's the crisis that brings to an end the subject of this semester's course, that destroys precisely those attitudes and assumptions and participants that you've studied so far. It's worth noting, while we're on the subject of Austria-Hungary, before we turn into the into the narrative itself. It's worth noticing that of the five great powers with which you began in this course, Prussia then becomes Germany, France, Russia, England, Austria, Hungary. Of those five, there's only one that isn't there anymore. Now, it's true the other four have all changed and their relative global position has been transformed in lots of different ways. But only one of the five is gone. And I think that is inseparable from the fact that the international system, the international environment, the the incubator, if you want to think of it that way, that the Austrians depended on, that that was destroyed by the crisis that we're going to be talking about now. Was it inevitable? Did it have to happen? Was that what Hume would call chance? Was that just a necessary but, but essentially inconsequential push towards a movement that was rolling on inexorably? Well, I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. I, I used to think it wasn't. I used to think, no, in 1914, the system still had a lot of life left in it. Well, but I'm not so sure, I have to admit. And one of the reasons I'm not so sure is that I'm not sure that the Austrians could have survived. And I think the question of whether war was inevitable really does turn on whether or not we can imagine a peaceful dissolution or a peaceful transformation of the Habsburg monarchy. If we can if we can imagine that somehow or another they could have resolved or learned to live with or in some sense managed, problems rarely go away, by the way. They get managed. If they could have managed their problems, then I suppose we could imagine that the European powers would have continued to live in peace as they had with relative success 
for over a century. But if, as I sometimes suspect, the Habsburgs were doomed, if they were going to fall apart, then it seems to me very difficult to imagine that uh, the international system could have survived without some kind of great, great power conflict. But while in the long run, the system, I think, would have had trouble surviving, there is no question whatsoever that war did not have to come in the summer of 1914. Perhaps in the long run, as the Habsburg monarchy began to disintegrate, as Franz Josef, 83 years old in 1914, finally died, uh, perhaps in the long run something would have happened, something else. But there is, I think, no doubt that war did not have to come in 1914. And in some ways, having survived the great crisis of the Balkan Wars, the international system was a little stronger in 1914 than it had been. Uh, a couple of years earlier. And that then takes us from the world of cause to the world of chance. And this takes us back to the Balkans and back to the province now of the Austrian Empire, Bosnia Herzegovina annexed, as you will remember, in 1908, run by them, uh, administered by them, since the Congress of Berlin in 1878, but now a firm part of the Austrian Empire. It was governed in 1914 by an Austrian general, a man named Oskar Padeorek, he looks like a general. And in fact, the only reason I can think of anybody would make him a general is because he looked like one. Because uh, his level of competence, I must say, was not, was not high. 1914 was not a good year for General Potterorik. Uh, in the first place, he invites uh, Franz Ferdinand to Sarajevo and is responsible for his security, does such a terrible job that, as we'll see, Franz Ferdinand is murdered. He then terribly mismanages the demonstrations that follow after uh, the assassination. And uh, before finally getting off and, being, and losing his job in December of 1914, botches terribly the opening campaigns. He's in command of the Austrian army, or this sector of the Austrian army in the south, and he does a terrible job and l- Tens and thousands of people are slaughtered because of his uh, incompetence. So as I said, it's not, not, a, not a good year. He's governor of Bosnia, which, as you will remember, uh, is a mixed, uh, a mixed play, a mixed, ethnically mixed area. Uh, there are Serbs, uh, there are Croats, a variety of others, some Jews, uh, a few Germans. Um, They are about 40% Orthodox, that is the Serbs, uh, maybe 25-30% Roman Catholic, the Croats, and then maybe about 30% or so Muslim. Maybe a little, maybe a somewhat more larger percentage of Muslims. So it's a mixed, it's a mixed group. Um, It's a group that in some cases is, is quite loyal to the Habsburg monarchy, particularly the people living in Sarajevo. Uh, where these various ethnic groups live together and, and, and feel a, a sort of willingness to cooperate. But out in the villages, uh, there's a lot of tension, and particularly in the Serbian villages, there's a thought that maybe Serbia would be a much better home for, for their, uh, a much better political home for them. Now, the governor decides that in order to sort of uh, bolster uh, the Habsburg presence and to increase the, the, to show the flag, as it were, that he will invite uh, the heir to the Habsburg throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, right here, that he will invite him to come to Bosnia to attend army maneuvers that are going to be held there. And then 
to spend a kind of ceremonial day in the capital of Bosnia, the town of Sarajevo. Franz Ferdinand is uh, the, the nephew of uh, Franz Josef, a difficult man in many ways, not beloved by uh, virtually anybody except the people in this picture. Um, a difficult man who uh, made the big mistake of falling in love with this, this woman here, Sophie Chotek, who was an aristocrat, but not of royal blood. Uh, she was a lady-in-waiting to one of the other Habsburg women. And they meet, and he falls in love with her. And he insists that they marry. Although, by doing this, he guarantees that these attractive youngsters in the picture will not be heirs to the Habsburg throne, since the mother is not of royal blood, and that instead the the throne will pass on after his death to yet another uh, nephew. Uh, Franz Joseph, the emperor, uh, a stickler for detail and for, for, uh, for the prerogatives of royalty, is furious that uh, Franz Ferdinand is going to marry this woman. He does, goes out of his way, gets up early in the morning to do things that will make life difficult for them. Um, but the reward is that Franz Joseph and Sophie, I'm happy to report to you, uh, have one of those rare, one of those rare uh, blissful royal marriages uh, of which uh, history is, has a relatively short record. Now, This is part of our story because the 28th of June, the day for Franz Ferdinand's ceremonial visit to Sarajevo, is also their wedding anniversary. So they decide that they will spend it together. And while Sophie might not ordinarily go on army maneuvers with her husband, she does meet him and go decide to spend the day with him uh, during this trip to Bosnia. So they... Franz Ferdinand, they they go separately. Uh, Franz Ferdinand goes to the army maneuvers. Here's the governor over here. Here's Franz Ferdinand. Uh, Goes to the army maneuvers. Uh, They go well. 20,000 men fire blank cartridges at one another, tramp around and uh, try various sorts of of war games. And Franz Ferdinand pronounces himself as satisfied with the the character of, of the troops and their their efficiency, and their courage, and so forth. So all of that goes perfectly well. Uh, then they go, they're staying at a hotel outside of town. Uh, they have a very pleasant Saturday night uh, banquet for some local notables. Uh, they get up early uh, Sunday morning. Uh, June the 28th is a, is a Sunday. Uh, they go to Mass, of course receive communion, um, and then set off by a short train uh, from this resort hotel about 10 kilometers outside of Sarajevo into the town itself. And they transfer uh, from the train to a a group of cars, the six of them that pick up Franz Ferdinand and his, and Sophie, of course, as well as their, their retinue. And here they are. Uh, in the car. Uh, This is the chauffeur, and as you'll see, if we're looking for somebody who started the First World War, we have to blame this man right here. Uh, But more about that in a minute. Well, they set off for the they set off for the train station. Here's the the train station where they arrived, and Sarajevo uh, is a, a, I recommend it to you by the way, if you're ever looking for a kind of of out-of-the-way spot in Europe to spend to spend some time. It's a very, very interesting city. Uh, it's a very, very beautiful city. Uh, and it's built along a river, as are so many European cities. Uh, so what happens is, what happened is the, the, the train comes down to the, 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 the station here, the, here are the railroad tracks. They get in the car and they drive along the river toward the Rathaus, that is to say the city hall, which is where the main ceremonies of the day are going. Now, unfortunately, 
in the crowd on that day, there are seven young people who have been sent into Sarajevo by this man here. This is Colonel Apis. This is, you can go by his sort of nom de guerre. Um, a Serbian colonel, one of the people who had murdered the Serbian king and queen in 1903, who was a high-ranking official in the Serbian Secret Service, um, and a member of a secret society that was designed to uh, spread Serbian uh, ethnic national uh, aspirations and uh, energies throughout the Balkans. These seven young men, the youngest is 17, the oldest is 27, most of them I suspect are about the age of the people in this room, that is 19, 20, 21. Uh, most of them are students, former students. Um, none of them are greatly successful, but none of them are terrible failures either. They're all patriots. They are all in love with the notion of a greater Serbia. And they all believe, or at least they think they do, that this is something not only worth killing for, but worth dying for. Now, there are two things about Sarajevo, June 28th, that, that are important to these people. One is the date itself, June 28th, which is the great Serbian holiday, still. St. Vitus Day, the day of the Battle of Kosovo. A Serbian defeat at the hands of the Ottomans that is one of the, the central stories in Serbia's vision of itself. Beware of nations that celebrate defeats, by the way. So June 28th, not a very well-chosen date for this affair. June 28th is the date of a great national holiday. Moreover, equally important, Sarajevo is the place of a recent martyrdom for the Serbian cause. Because in 1910, just four years earlier, a group of Serbian patriots had tried to assassinate the Austrian governor. And the assassin, having failed, took cyanide and died. A martyr's death is an uh, example of his of his courage and heroism and self-sacrifice. So these seven young men, armed, trained, if that's really not a too dignified word for the little bit of target practice they were given, uh, are sent into Sarajevo with the idea that they will kill Franz Ferdinand and then die themselves. This is a suicide squad. Why do they want to kill San Ferdinand? Well, for a while they thought they, might, they ought to kill Patiorek, the governor, um, a likely target in some ways. But they decide, no, they're going, to go, they're going to go big. They're going to go for Franz Ferdinand. They do under the absolutely erroneous belief that he is a warmonger. Because these people, this is not done to start a war. If anything... Colonel Apis here, Dimitrovich is his name, Colonel Apis here wants a few years to kind of absorb and, and solidify Serbia's position after the victories in the, in the Balkan Wars. And he's afraid that Franz Ferdinand is likely to not let that happen. So they, wanna, they want martyrdom. They want a great event to, to celebrate and to uh, demonstrate Serbia's place in the world. They want to become national heroes, sung and celebrated in the history books of the future. And they want to get rid of somebody they feel is a, is a threat to Serbia's national interests. Well, the first thing that happens as the caravan goes along is that one of these seven steps forward, 
throws a bomb, and you have to knock, the, these are rather primitive bombs, and you knock the head off of it against a hard object, and then you, you toss it. Well, the chauffeur hears that crack as the head gets knocked off the bomb, the fuse, and he speeds up. So the bomb gets thrown, it misses Franz Ferdinand's car, hits the one behind it, goes off, wounds some of the people in that car, causes a cut in uh, Sophie's cheek, but otherwise she's okay. And the bomb thrower takes his cyanide capsule, which is what he's supposed to do, bites down on it, and leaps over the side of the, remember this is going along the river, into the water. Well, the cyanide is old, burns his throat but doesn't kill him, the water is shallow, so he sort of lands in a mud puddle and does not drown. He's immediately arrested. And uh, the crowd, and the, the, after Franz Ferdinand, who, who, who is not a lovable character in many ways, but he's brave. He's brave. He stops. He gets out of the car. He goes and tries to be sure that everybody's all right. Um, gets back in, and off they go to the city hall. And there uh, he listens to a speech of welcome, which one can imagine is a certain amount of skepticism. Uh, he says, you know, what are you, what are you you're talking about? How, much, how glad you are to hear us. Somebody's just tried to kill us. And Sophie says, relax, relax. Now, just calm down, calm down. Give your speech, give your speech. So he gives his speech, and he hears these speeches of welcome, and they have a meeting uh, with the dignitaries of the town. Here we see them here. Uh, and you can see by the, 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 the religious mixture here uh, 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 of the various people in Sarajevo. This is a really a, multi, a, multicultural, a multicultural community. And here they are uh, leaving to go back. The day is over. They are, they hope, going to finally go home. Uh, they decide that Here's the rod house here, and here's the, here's the route that they were going to go. But they decide, no, no, actually, here's the route they were going to go. They were going to go up this street here and over through town to a museum that they were going to visit. No, this street right here. Here it is. Franz Joseph Street. But the security people decide that that's too dangerous. This is a narrow street. The chances of, of getting stuck here, the chances that there are more assassins out in the, in the area are too great. So they decide they will change the route and instead drive straight back, where they can go fast, straight back along the river uh, down and, and where they can then get on the train and go. Unfortunately, they don't tell the chauffeur that they've changed the route. So he sets off, driving down, and he makes the turn to get on to Franz Josefstrasse. Whereas one of the people in the car says, stop, stop, this is wrong, this is wrong. We're not supposed to go this way. So the chauffeur stops, puts the car into reverse, backs up, and he backs up to within about five feet of where Gabriello Princip, one of the seven, is standing. The others have had chances in the course of the day, or at least a couple of them have, and they've all lost their nerve. Uh, Princip has not. He's committed. He's coming out of a, of a small store, and suddenly he looks up, and he sees there's Franz Ferdinand and his car as far away as this man in the white coat. He's armed with a small pistol. He steps forward, doesn't take great marksmanship to fire it. He hits both Sophie and Franz Ferdinand and wounds them fatally. He's immediately grabbed and, and arrested uh, by, the, by, the, by the bystanders. In fact, he's almost lynched uh, by, by them and is finally freed. Uh, Franz Ferdinand, um, who was dying, 
shot in the throat. He's dying. He's asked by one of his attendants, are you all right? Are you all right? And he says, and these are his last words, and I will put them on the list of the most inappropriate last words of all time. He says, no, it's nothing. Um, Well, of course, it is something. And uh, that's what we'll talk about now for the next few minutes. You can see that even in death, the hierarchy of the Habsburgs is retained. Sophie's casket is several feet lower than Franz Ferdinand. She's an aristocrat, but not of royal birth. They don't get buried in the Kapuzinerkruf, the the main burial chapel for the Habsburgs, but are, are sent off to some much less valuable piece of funereal real estate further away from from town. So, now begins what is known in the literature as the July Crisis. I dare say we know more about what happens between the 28th of June and the 4th of August than about virtually any comparable period of history anywhere. We're largely interested in the behavior of a group of men, and they are all men, a group of men that numbers somewhere around 60. There are, I think, about a dozen real decision makers about a dozen people whose decisions really determine that at the end of this process, there's a European war. But if we count everybody else, the advisors, the ambassadors, the messengers, and so forth and so on, we probably get up to about 60. The oldest, I suppose, is Franz Joseph, who's 83. Uh, The youngest is a couple of counselors in the Austrian Foreign Office who are in their middle 30s. But most of these... Men are in their 50s and 60s. Almost all of them have had long careers. Almost all of them have been successful. Except for the French, almost all of them are aristocrats. Almost all of them have titles of one kind or another. And many of them have known each other in in one way or another for quite a while. Almost all of them speak French. And almost all of them will communicate with one another in French. About what they said and did during this period from the 28th of June to the 4th of August, about what they said and did, we have information of several different sorts. There are, of course, the official documents, the things that were published or public notes that were sent back and forth. Confidential, perhaps, in the sense that they weren't put in the daily newspaper, but, but meant to be read by, uh, other, by foreign governments and the like. We have the records of personal meetings, some of them taken officially by, by note-takers, by secretaries, um, others taken by people as uh, aids to their memory. We've got letters, some letters that people write to their wives or or lady friends or so forth uh, in order to to keep keep them up with what's what's going on. So we've got a whole cluster of uh, material that is generated at the time. There are problems with all of it. Some of them are problems that uh, come from the fact that people don't tell the truth shock, actually, but there it is. Uh, But more often than that, it's not that people don't tell the truth. That's usually easier to spot. Uh, Their problem is because lots of people see what they want to see, or equally so, tell the people they're writing to what they think they want to hear. We'll see some examples of that in, in just a minute. In addition to this enormous quantity of contemporary documents. 
uh, we of course got we of course have a, a library of memoirs. Everybody who was still alive, or virtually everybody who was still alive uh, once the war was over, wrote his memoirs. And again, as you can easily see, very informative, but not without their problems. Because if the people at the time who are writing this down, very often at the end of a very long and difficult and stressful day, if the people at the time only see a piece of what's going on, the people who write the memoirs know what happened. And that inevitably colors their version of what they did to make it happen. So in a certain sense, while the, the, the authors of the contemporary materials know too little, the authors of the memoirs know too much. And it's very difficult for anybody to imagine what it's like not to know. A third, uh, the, the number of people involved, the kinds of sources, a third reflection on the July crisis before getting into the events themselves. And that has to do with, with what we might describe as the, the tempo of events. I, on, the, on the handout I gave you, you see I divided it into three stages. Um, there is an opening stage, which is largely made up of decisions taken in this building here. This is the Ballhaus. This is the, the center then and now of the Austrian foreign ministry. Um, and uh, the first stage are, are decisions taken there and then moved out from there to Berlin. Then there's a middle period uh, in which um, not much happens officially, but, but lots of things go on behind the scenes. And then a, a final stage, beginning with the, with the Austrian declaration of war against Serbia on the 28th of July, a final stage that takes us right into the, right into the war itself. Um, it is, I think, best to think about this tempo of events, not as the inevitable march towards war, but rather as a narrowing of possibilities. 28th of June, when Franz Ferdinand is murdered, there, there are lots of things that can happen. Once the Austrians decide they're going to punish Serbia, a lot of alternatives narrow. But even then, the possibility of avoiding or managing a European-wide war remains open, I think, down really to the very end of July. All right, with that, with that sort of general set of things in mind, let me, let me tell you this story and try to make it as, as clear as I can. Inevitably, uh, in the telling, it it's, turns out to be it's going to seem a lot simpler than it was. I want to leave out some players. The Italians, who have a certain role, are not going to be mentioned again. Uh, but nonetheless, let's see, what we can, let's see what we can do. Okay. 29th of uh, June, the day after, it's a Monday, is a holiday uh, in Vienna. There are, uh, everything's closed. People are still more or less in a celebratory mood. People were shocked by the news of Franz Ferdinand's murder, but I have to say that there were not very many sorrowful people. He was not a popular, a not a popular figure, and and uh, you know things things went on. But the people in the government, particularly the people inhabiting whose offices were in this building here, recognized that this was a perfect opportunity, a perfect opportunity to punish the Serbs. Indeed, not necessarily to destroy Serbia as a state, but certainly to significantly limit Serbia's ability both to act internationally against the Habsburgs, but also to act as a magnet for the South Slavic population of the monarchy itself. This is a big decision. 
It's a decision, and the leading member to take this decision is the man shown here, Leopold von Berthold, the foreign minister, a man with a reputation of being something of a, of a wimp, uh, of not a decisive, vigorous person, but who now, for whatever reason, decides this is the moment. And he drives the process more than any single person. If you don't want to blame the chauffeur, blame him. Now, Berthold knows that he's going to have to have the support of the emperor, of Franz Joseph. Franz Joseph is old. He's a kind of a ceremonial figure, but he's also a, a decision maker. And when he says, goes. So Berthold goes out to Schönbrunn, the, the beautiful palace on the outskirts of the city where the emperor has come back. He goes there on the 30th of June, two days after the assassination, to talk about what's going to happen next. Tells him that he feels that they ought to do something, they ought to do something vigorous. Franz Joseph says, well, maybe, maybe so. But be sure that you have the support of Count Tisa. Talk about him in a minute, the Hungarian foreign minister, the Hungarian prime minister, and he says, "Be sure you have support from Germany." Well, it looks as though the Emperor of Germany, William II, will come to Vienna for Franz Ferdinand's funeral. Actually, William II turns out to be one of the few people in Europe who actually liked Franz Ferdinand uh, and was really very unhappy about his his murder. But he's, the, 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 William II is told that the security situation uh, is such that he better not risk going to the Austrian capital. So he doesn't go to the funeral. And that means that what people thought of as a chance to, to consolidate and to consult um, with the Germans would not take place in Vienna, but would instead. This is, this is uh, Conrad, the head of the, uh, of the Austrian general staff, as I said. Conrad's easy. War, right? That's what he wants. He doesn't change his mind. Uh, there's no subtlety there. Um, so the decision then is made, since some of the consulting of the Germans is going to take place not in Vienna, but in Berlin, uh, Berchtold sends to Berlin this man here, Count Hoyos, uh, 39 years old, a, a career civil servant, and a hawk. He wants war, too. Belongs to a to a group of sort of middle middle level uh, civil servants in the foreign ministry, people in their late thirties, early forties, who feel that they've been pushed around, that Austria has been humiliated, and that it's time to get tough. It's time to act, and this is, after all, a perfect moment, right? There's really good reason to think that the Serbs have been involved in this. They don't know the details. They don't know about this secret uh, operation, but there's every good reason to think that the Serbs were involved and that this would be an opportunity then to use that, to use the outrage which they feel. So Hoyos is sent to Berlin on the 5th of July. It's a Sunday, it's a week after the assassination now. Um, he meets, he's carrying a, a, a memo written, prepared in the foreign office, as well as a letter from Franz Joseph to William II. The um, Austrian ambassador in Berlin, Hoyos meets with people in the foreign ministry. The Austrian ambassador in Berlin comes out here. This is the Neues Palais in Potsdam, now rebuilt, not quite as splendid as we see it here, but rebuilt somewhat, and it was here that William II was spending the day. So the ambassador comes out. He gets there in the middle of the morning. They have a long conversation. They have lunch. And in the late afternoon, he goes home. Now here's an example of a source problem. Because he spends three or four hours, the ambassador does. He spends three or four hours with William II. And we have about a 250-word summary of their meeting. And in this summary, the ambassador reports to his superiors in Vienna that William II is prepared to support Vienna in their vigorous actions against 
the serfs. They talked about a lot of different things. And I'm sure that, that William II gave that impression with it all. But the very fact of boiling down two or three hours of conversation into a 200-word memo suggests that a lot of stuff gets left out. What's important for our purposes, though, is that the people in Vienna believe that the Germans will back them up. And when uh, the day after this meeting on Sunday, the 5th of July, when the day after, when Hoyos and the ambassador and others meets with uh, the chancellor, here's William II, here's the chancellor, Patton von Holbeck, uh, when they meet with him the next day, he seems also to say, okay, do it, do it. If you're going to do, you do, you're going to act against the Serbs, do it, but do it now, do it quickly. Two things are important about the 5th and 6th of July. And if we think about it again as a process of narrowing, two things are important. First thing, German support. The Germans said, no, this is too dangerous. You're going to blow us all up. The Austrians would not have been able to go on. They would have had a second, they would have had to have a second thought about it. It would have, been, it would have had lots of consequences, but that would have been. The second thing about this and this is equally important, is that once the Germans said to the Austrians, go do what you have to do, they then sort of stop paying much attention. Uh, Benjamin Holland goes back to his estate. He's mourning his wife who had died just a few weeks earlier. He's sort of a depressive character under the best of circumstances. He's even more depressed now. William II goes off for a three-week cruise in Scandinavia. So the Germans give the famous blank, blank check to the Austrians, but make very little effort to either coordinate or control what goes on next. Hoyos gets back to Berlin, again back to Vienna rather, and the assumption is, among people in Berlin certainly, that something's going to happen pretty soon. But it doesn't. And this goes back to the, the tempo. If the Austrians, having gotten the okay from Berlin on the 5th and 6th of July, if the Austrians had acted immediately against the Serbs, there probably would not have been a European war. They delay, allowing all kinds of forces to mobilize and line up around them that make this war more likely. And, and one of the reasons for the delay is Count Tisa, the man whose picture we see here, the, the uh, prime minister of Hungary. You remember Austria-Hungary have a kind of a, a, not kind of, have a dual government. He is the prime minister of the Hungarian side. And he is, at least on the 7th of July, when the, when the ministers meet to hear about what happened in Berlin, he is against war. He doesn't love the Serbs, but he doesn't want a conquered Serbia, and the last thing he wants is more Serbs in the Habsburg monarchy, which he feels will weaken the position of the Hungarians. So one of the reasons there has to be a delay is that they've got to persuade Tisa. They've got to persuade him to go along, and it takes over a week to do that. In the meantime, they're concealing, the Austrians that is, concealing what they're doing. They're trying not to let anybody know what's going to happen next. Franz Ferdinand has his funeral, but otherwise there's not a lot of talk. Um, this is the um, Russian ambassador to Belgrade. I've got a story about him, but unfortunately I don't have time to tell it. The only thing I'll say about him is, in the middle of it all, he dies of a heart attack. Uh, it's part of the uh, one of the little bits of side dramas that, that goes on. This is the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Sazonov, um, who again has a reputation for being something of a uh, indecisive and, and weak, but again decides that he's not going to let Serbia be humiliated. And so, as the 
rumors of what's going to happen in Vienna come out. As these rumors come out, uh, Sazonov begins to issue more and more strict warnings that Russia will not sit by and let Serbia be destroyed. In the meantime, in Vienna, all the attention is is put on convincing Tisa that this is the time to do something. And by the 14th of July, they have succeeded in doing it. But the Austrians still delay. And they delay for several reasons. One, much of their army is on so-called harvest leave. That is to say, the soldiers have been let out of active duty so they could bring in the harvest, which meant it would be more difficult to mobilize them and get them ready for battle. And second, they, the Austrians are worried because the president of France, Raymond Poincaré, is scheduled to make a state visit to Tsar Nicholas II in Russia on the 20th of July. And the the Austrians do not want to have this crisis bubbling while these two characters are together. So they decide they will deliver an ultimatum to the Serbs, but they will wait and do it until after the state visit is over. Interestingly enough, the biggest gap in our sources is what these two guys talk about. There's really, we don't know anywhere near as much as we would like to know about what went on during the time they met. There's a sense that the Serbian crisis, which was not on their original agenda, becomes more and more important But what exactly they decide and how important that is seems to me to be still very much an open question. Okay, 23rd of July, Poincaré and the Prime Minister Viviani are on their way back to France on a battleship. And the Austrians deliver in Belgrade an ultimatum which they have written in a way that it will be rejected. They have included in this ultimatum the demand that the Serbs allow Austrian policemen to join in an investigation of Franz Ferdinand's murder, a violation of sovereignty that no state would be willing to entertain particularly a state led by um, this man here, Nikolai Pasic. He's running for office, by the way. He's in the middle of a national election. He's also very much worried about the Serbian army, and he simply is not in a position to accept these. Um, He writes a very careful, and he feels in many ways, accommodating response. But in the end... uh, he has to reject the. He has to reject the the most important element in the in the Austrian uh, ultimatum, and the Austrian Austrian ambassador, as he's instructed to do, severs relationships, packs up, burns his code, gets on the train, and leaves. Thereby, this is the 25th of July, uh, severing relations between Austria and Serbia. Not war. The decision was you give the Serbs an ultimatum, they don't go along, then you go to war. But again, the Austrians delay. The army's not quite ready. They're not quite sure when they're going to go. Meanwhile, at this point, once the ultimatum has been given and refused, everybody realizes things are serious. There's this false calm from the beginning of, from the assassination itself down to the 25th of July, almost a month, right? This is false calm, but now the rumors, the call, the the intercepted documents, the decoded messages, all of these things that have been floating around clarify, and it's clear to the great powers, that the possibility of a European war is very much apparent. Nobody wants one. 
And that, I think, is an important thing as we try to figure out what's happening in these final days of peace. Because nobody wants a European war. God knows nobody wants the European war they get. But they do want things. They do want things that will make war happen. The Austrians want to humiliate the Serbs, and they're not going to back down. The Germans will not, cannot, do not control the Austrians and allow them to really set the stage, set the pace until it's too late. By the time the Germans, in the very last hours of peace, by the time the Germans try to impose some sort of restraint on the Austrians, the game is over. The Russians will not let the Serbs go under. They will not repeat the crisis, the the humiliation of 1908-1909. They feel they are militarily and politically in much better shape now than they were then. And while they would be willing to think about some retreat for the Austrians, they tell Pasich that he should stand tough, stay in there, and not let the Austrians push him around any further. The question now is, as this process begins to get tenser and tenser, what about the military? When's, when's the military going to come into action? How much longer, how long can you wait? How long can you wait before you get your armies ready? Who can begin to move second? And what's the cost of that? And that in the 29th, 30, 29th of July, 30th of July, that then becomes an important driving factor. First in Russia which is the first great power to mobilize, then in the case of the Germans, who must mobilize against the Russians, then in the case of the French, who must mobilize to support their Russian allies, and finally, at the end of it all, and you'll hear about more about this a week from today, finally, the British who, who decide at the end that they will also support their allies. Notice how everybody... Notice notice how nobody wants a European war. But as these alternatives narrow, everybody decides that going to war is better than not. That's the paradox. That's the the paradox of of this July crisis. Nobody wants a war. But in the end, as the decisions unfold, everybody feels that they must go along and that the alternative to not fighting is worse than the alternative to fighting. This is true most obviously of the Austrians. It's true of the Serbs. It's true of the Russians. It's true of the French. It's true of the Germans. And in the end, again, you'll see this week from now, this just becomes true of the British as well. I don't think it's right to talk about guilt. I gave you at the very end of the handout some various positions that people have taken about this question. I don't think it makes sense to talk about guilt. I do think it makes sense to talk about responsibility. And here I think the responsibility of the Austrians is far and away the greatest. Responsibility of the Germans is largely one of of not monitoring and trying to control the Austrians. So I think the responsibility is unevenly distributed. But at the heart of the matter are a series of choices. Choices that everybody makes, believing, as I said, believing that the choice for war, as painful as it might be, as dangerous as it might be, that the choice for war is better than the choice for peace. Remember, the war they choose to go to is not the war they get. 
Karl Marx once wrote, men make history, but they don't make the history they want to make. And that, I think, is a perfect summary of what happens in July of 1914. These people, these decision makers, they're making history. They're making choices. But they're making choices that take them into a historical world that they cannot imagine. A historical world in many ways that destroys everything that they thought they were trying to fight to defend. 